In this video, I'm going to talk to you about an alternative model to predict where gold is deposited out of a flow, whether that be in a creek, a river, or your sluice. Having a more accurate understanding of the mechanisms which cause gold to be deposited in particular spots and not others is going to help you find more gold faster and more efficiently, whether you're a novice prospector or a seriously experienced old timer. G'day, my name's Stuart Chignall and welcome to Mad Scientist Prospecting. Just taking a walk along Bendio Creek, which is not exactly the most aesthetic of creeks, all being confined in the culvert like it is here. But I needed to stretch my legs uh, after the meeting I just had. Now in the last episode I spoke about and gave a series of examples why the low pressure model of alluvial prospecting or the low pressure model of determining where gold is deposited is wrong. A few people, mostly on Facebook, not so much on YouTube, mounted a defense for the low pressure model, including one gentleman who I really respect and admire. He's taught me through his YouTube videos a lot about prospecting. And so I thought about dealing with those comments, dealing with those criticisms of what I was saying in, I don't know, episode 5.5 or an, uh, an extra episode to kind of finally put the low pressure model in its grave. But one of the things that the guys that have been with me from the very start of this series have said is that they want the next bit. They want the next bit of information and it's been taking me a while to get it out to them. So rather than dealing with those comments from the new arrivals to this series, I'm going to forge ahead and start telling you about the actual mechanism that causes gold to be deposited. But before we do that, I think it's going to be easier for you to understand what causes causes gold to be deposited if you understand what causes it to be picked up in the first place. And when you've got a particle that is resting upon a surface, now there's two forces we care about in this situation. There's an action force and there's a reaction force. Pulling this piece of rock down into the center of the ground on this, uh, this false bedrock surface here is gravity. We know gravity's working, we can check. Yep, gravity's working. So there must be an equal and opposite force that is preventing this particle from going any further. If the, it, and it must be equal and opposite because if it was greater, the particle would come back up. Now whenever you've got a surface that is capable of providing that reaction force, the particle won't sink any further. If the particle is resting on a surface that can't produce that reaction force, like say a soft mud or water or air, the particle sinks. Now, you might think that that's stating the bleeding obvious, and well, it is. But the reason I'm doing it is it's very important that you think about the forces and the reaction forces that are involved. It's only by understanding those that you can really get your head around what's happening with the gold. Because nothing happens unless a force makes it happen. And nothing stops unless a force makes it stop. Now as the water begins to flow, the two more action forces come into bear and one reaction force. Now the first of those action forces from the water flowing past the particle is the impulse force. That's the water smacking into the particle. The magnitude of that force is determined by the velocity of the water, the direct surface that is impacted on the particle. Hey, whoa, 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 whoa. It's not that simple. Yeah, I know it's not that simple, but I'm not going to be talking about uplift and downlift forces in this because that requires a whole nother video on vectors and no, no. Sim just keeping this simple, it's a model, chill. And the last thing is the density of the water. Now you might think that the density of the water is not really going to change. 1,000 kilos per cubic meter. Is, is what it's going to be. And it does change a little bit with temperature, um, but not in any sort of significant way. It does change a little bit with what is dissolved in the water, a little bit more significantly. But the big thing that can influence density is what is entrained 
with the flowing fluid. Uh, particularly uh, lighter particles like your clays and silts and fine sands, you can get a lot of those in a moving flow, which significantly adds to the density. But also uh, larger grains of sand, small grains of gravels, and even if it's a serious flow, rocks. They all add to the density of the flow. Uh, and especially in the case of a rock, if a rock's channeling down the flow and it goes smack into a particle, well then it's not so much the density of the fluid that is providing the impulse force, but the density of the rock, uh, the rock on rock contact, or, or rock on whatever contact. Yeah, except that's not right. When you're talking about the impulse force that is applied to a particle by a fluid, then the density of the fluid is important because you're not dealing with a discrete amount. You're talking about an interaction between surface areas. But when you're talking about a significant particle that is entrained within a flow, density isn't important. What is important is the velocity of the particle the total mass of the particle. Uh, because density is a derived attribute, it's not a fundamental attribute. That is an important distinction, which we'll get to later. The second force, the second action force, is friction. It's the friction of the water moving, not, not directly impacting the particle, but moving past it. Now the magnitude of that force is dependent upon the velocity. The velocity is the biggest factor because as we've talked about in previous episodes, friction in fluids is proportional to the square of the velocity. Increase the velocity a little bit, you're going to increase the friction a lot. But it's also dependent upon uh, the, the surface area that is in contact with the, the, the flowing water. Uh, the, the, the roughness of the particle plays a big part. With the rough of the particle, the, provide, the more friction. Whoa, 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 no, 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 it's not that simple. With very rough surfaces, especially rough surfaces with a high velocity flow, we get that situation we've talked about in previous episodes where you get high velocity flow scooting past low velocity flow behind the obstruction. In this case, the obstruction is the roughness of uh, the surface. And that creates an impermeable kind of barrier which essentially traps a layer of water against the rough surface which means that the surface that's interacting with the flow is water and that drastically lowers the friction that is experienced. And that's why relatively rough surfaces like concrete, wooden staves, stone flagstones can still be uh, very good materials to make channels out of and allow very good flowing water. It's because of that sort of you know, low friction layer that gets set up. Yeah, but did we need to cover that like now? No, no. All right, where was I? Friction. Oh, viscosity. But viscosity barely changes at all with temperature or indeed with anything else. It's, it's pretty much, for our purposes, constant. Au contraire. The viscosity of the water barely changes. But if you start getting a whole stack of particles entrained within the flow, the viscosity can increase dramatically. And those of you who've got a bit of experience with recirculating high bankers and recirculating sluices, you would have seen this. You would have seen that once you've been running your equipment for a while and that water's gone through your sluice, you know, a, bu a bunch of times and you've put a bunch of material through, that it starts to get very soupy. And that is because of all the added viscosity that the clays and the silts in particular add to the fluid. And that's an important piece of information to know because if the friction is increased that is moving the particles through, that means that gold is less likely to drop out of the flow when the viscosity is increased, which it's going to be increased if you've been recirculating your fluid for quite a while. So bear that in mind. Now, opposing these two forces is the reaction force, because there's always a reaction force. And again, that is friction, but it's the friction between the particle and the surface it's resting upon. Again, that's dependent upon the roughness. Uh, and if the roughness of the particle and the surface it's resting on are complementary, that can dramatically increase the friction because you get the next major component 
in, in what determines the magnitude of the reaction force, which is the surface area of the direct, the area of direct contact between the two surfaces, between the particle and the surface it's resting upon. As that gets larger, you get more friction. The next thing it's dependent upon is gravity. And the last thing is the total mass of the particle. Those are the things that determine how big the friction force is holding the particle in place. Now when the reaction forces increase and they take the system out of equilibrium so that the reaction force becomes less than the action forces, that's when the particle moves and it, will, and it takes off down the stream. When the reaction force gets larger than the action forces, that's when the particle comes out of flow. He's being controversial again. Because did you notice he didn't mention density? Yeah, yeah, as if saying that gold doesn't collect in low pressure zones wasn't controversial enough. Yeah, it's not, actually, actually doesn't have anything to do with density either. Density is a derived attribute. It's not a fundamental attribute. And that'll be clearer as we go on further. Once the particle starts moving, it starts accelerating. As soon as it starts accelerating, its velocity is increasing. And that means that the velocity differential between the particle and the flowing fluid water goes down. And since the magnitude of those action forces is not dependent on the velocity of the fluid, it's dependent upon the velocity differential between the fluid and the particle. But while <laughs> the action force goes drastically down, the reaction force almost disappears. Because once the particle's moving, it essentially loses contact with the bed, with the surface on which it's resting. If it loses contact with that surface, then there's no, there is no friction with it. Now in high flowing water, when you've got very, very violent flow, very turbulent flow, that particle, once it's up and liberated from the surface, is going to be tossed around all over the place. In extremely violent, turbulent flow, gold is not traveling down the bottom in a layer trundling along the bottom. It is tossed every which way, just like the big boulders are, the logs and everything else in fully turbulent flow. And that's because fully turbulent flow is mixing flow. And when you have mixing flow, everything gets mixed. But as the energy of the flow begins to subside, that's when you start to get a laminar flow appearing. The less turbulence, the less mixing forces, the less mixing effects, the less likely it is that there's gonna be enough up force, uplifting forces, to throw particles higher in the, the flow. So they tend to start collecting down the bottom. The heavier those materials are relative to their surface area, the more likely that is. Now at some point, the energy in the flow is going to diminish that the particles start touching the surface of the channel through which they're moving. And at that point, there's a chance for a reaction force to be created and to maybe stop a particle, but not really. <laughs> you see, when a particle is moving and it touches the surface of the channel, the amount that it touches is barely, it's just a tiny little point touch. That means that the total surface area in touch is minuscule, which means the total amount of friction that can be generated by that touch is minuscule. Now the particle will lose a little bit of energy. Not much, but a little bit. But as soon as it loses contact, and it's almost certainly going to lose contact because of its inertia, which will keep it moving, it re-enters the flow and begins to be re-accelerated back up to that terminal velocity. So touching a hard surface very, very rarely results in a particle being trapped. It's almost, it just basically, it, you can almost say it just doesn't you can almost just say it doesn't happen. Yep, that's, that's, that's pretty much right. Yep, that's fair. So what causes particles to, be, to, to come out of the flow is what we'll be talking about in the next episode. I've been working to a strategy that is better to get these videos out rather than to get them better. Things that are going on in life, it's just, it's just crazy. And if I didn't publish this video now, then I probably wouldn't be able to 
get it done until the end of next week sometime. And so I think it's better to get this one done here and then it's done and then the pressure's off me for a little bit and I can concentrate on getting the next bit done really, really well. Because the next bit is where it's starting to get complicated. The next bit is where we're putting all this information together to actually talk about what happens and how we can use that to find more gold. Hope you've enjoyed this video. I, I'm, as always, I'm open for questions. I'm ha happy to have the discussion. For those of you who've been questioning, what I, uh, questioning as in, um, what's the right word? It's not criticizing, although it is criticism. Doubting, maybe. Doubting the veracity of what I've been saying. You still haven't got enough information for really cut to, to really cast full judgment. Hopefully by the end of the next video, the picture will be clearer. So stay tuned for that. If you don't want to miss it, make sure you subscribe and hit the bell notification. And I'll catch you guys real soon.